Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to continue my mini-series on game theory. Last time, we talked about the game of Nim, and this video builds on that one, so I've linked it below, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking that out first. Today, we're going to dig a bit deeper and see that just beneath the surface lies a beautiful structure called the Nimbers. Fair warning, there's a lot to cover, and some of it's a bit tricky. But I think the results are really pretty, so I hope you'll stick with me. We'll start with an observation. If we have a game of Nim with two piles, there's a natural strategy. Make the piles equal. Then, whatever the opponent does in one pile, we can mirror in the other. So, when the opponent eventually empties one pile, we can empty the other and win. Okay, what if we had three piles? As we saw last time, we can win by making the nim sum zero. So moving to a position like this one, where six plus three plus five with our nim addition gives zero. Or looking at that another way, we can make the sum of these two piles equal the third. So 6 plus 3 equals 5. Then whatever move the opponent makes will either change the sum on the left or the pile on the right. And in either case, there's some move we can make to undo that and make the sum equal the pile again. So, in some sense, there's a balance between this game with two piles and this game with one that we can find by playing the two games together. We can push this idea a bit further. There's a theorem of Sprague and Grundy which says that any position in an impartial game, that is, a game where the players follow the same rules, balances in this way with some single pile in NIM. Why should that be true? We can think of the positions of a game as a network of nodes, with arrows between them representing possible moves. And we'll assign a value to each position as follows. Each end position, where there are no arrows going out, only arrows coming in, gets a value of zero. And for every other position, we'll give it the smallest whole number that we can't reach in one move the so-called minimum excluded value. So this position can't be a zero since we can reach zero in one move, so it has to be a one. And this one can reach zero and one, so it has to be a two. And this one can reach zero and two, but not one. It would take two moves to get there. So this one must have value one. And this one can reach one and two, so it has value zero and so on. As an exercise, see if you can fill in the Sprague-Grundy values for the rest of these positions. And this might feel a little bit familiar. In the last video, we defined P and N positions by which positions we could reach. And in fact, it's not too hard to see that the positions with value 0 are the P positions. And the rest are the n positions. But now we've got just a little bit more information than just p or n, and that makes all the difference when we start combining games. If we have two games, there's a natural way to combine them. Put both games on the table at once. A move in this combined game is a move in one game or a move in the other, using the corresponding rules. As usual, the last player who can move wins. We'll call this the sum of the two games. It turns out the Sprague-Grundy value for the sum of games is the nim sum of the values of the two games separately. So, if one game has value 3, and the other has value 5, then their sum 
has value 3 plus 5, which is 6. In fact, nim itself is a sum. It's the sum of games with just one pile. And it's easy to check that for a single pile, the Sprague Grundy value is just the size of the pile. So the value of a game of NIM is the NIM sum of the sizes of the piles. Which is why, as we saw last time, the winning strategy is to make that sum zero. So any position in an impartial game has a Sprague Grundy value and a NIM pile of that size will have the same value. And if we add them together, the total is zero, which makes it a P position. That is, there's always a NIM pile which can balance with a given position. And these values are numbers corresponding to NIM piles, or, if you prefer, NIMBERS. If there's addition of numbers, it's natural to ask if there's also subtraction. And it's not too hard to show that if you add a number to itself, you always get zero. You can see this using the binary representation we saw last time. And this is what we would expect subtraction to look like. So, for the numbers, addition and subtraction are really the same thing. Okay, so we have addition, subtraction. How about multiplication? We'll get to that in a moment, but first, it's helpful to reframe NIM not as a game of counters and piles, but as a game of turning over coins. To do that, consider a position of NIM like this one. We'll count the number of piles of each size. In this case, we have three piles of size 1, two piles of size 2, and so on. And we'll lay out a line of coins, one for each size. With the red side up if the count is odd, and blue if the count is even. And every time we make a move in NIM, we'll flip over the coins accordingly. So if we remove a counter from this pile, there's now one less pile of size 2 and one more of size 1. And if we take two counters from here, we flip over the 5 and the 3. And if we take all the counters from this pile, we flip over the 4 and well, for the sake of consistency, we'd like to always flip over two coins, so we'll put another coin down and say it's at position zero. It's really a placeholder, so it doesn't matter too much which side is up. So we can describe a game of NIM in terms of this row of coins. But we could equally imagine throwing all those counters out and playing a game with those coins directly. On each turn, we flip over two coins. And to make sure that the game ends eventually, we'll add the rule that the rightmost of the two coins always goes from red to blue. And as usual, the last move wins. As an exercise, see if you can prove that this game, known as Twins, is equivalent to NIM, and that the Sprague Grundy value of a position is the NIM sum of the sizes of the corresponding piles. When we go from addition to multiplication with regular numbers, we go from lines to rectangles. So let's do the same with games. We'll take twins and extend it to two dimensions. Instead of a line of coins, we have a grid and a move is flipping over the four corners of a rectangle, with the rule that the bottom right corner of that rectangle goes from red to blue. This game is called Turning Corners. Let's analyze it. In the same way that a NIM position can be written as the sum of individual piles, 
a position in twins can be written as the sum of positions with one red coin. And the same is true of turning corners. A position like this one can be written as the sum of positions like these. So really, we only need to consider games that start with one red coin. Let's build a table of Sprague Grundy values. We'll put the value for the game with the red coin in each position in the corresponding position in a grid. If the red coin is on the left, like so, or at the top, well, it can't be at the bottom right corner of the rectangle, so there's no legal move. That means the value has to be zero for each of these positions. Okay, what if the red coin is here? Well, then there's only one move. Flip over these four coins. And this can be written as the sum of this position, this position, and this position, which, as we've seen, is zero plus zero plus zero. And since the only move takes us to a zero position, this position must have value one. Okay, what if instead we have this red coin? Well, now there are two options. We could flip over these four coins, which would give us 0 plus 0 plus 0, which is 0. Or we could flip over these four, which would give us 0 plus 0 plus 1, which is 1. So this position has to have value 2. And by the same logic, this position will have value 2 as well. Okay, what about this one? Well, now there are four possible moves. We could flip over these four, these four, these four, or these four, which give us values 0, 2, 2, and 1, respectively. So this position must have value 3. And so on. We can fill in values for our table by looking at every possible rectangle and finding the minimum excluded sum. So let's expand this a little bit further. Now that we have some more values, we can start to see some patterns. For one, this looks a lot like a multiplication table. Zero times anything is zero, one times anything is itself, and so we can use this as a definition for number multiplication. The number at coordinates a, b is a times b. So 5 times 4 is 2. And if you try a few numbers, you'll find that this multiplication is commutative, it's associative, and it distributes over nim addition. In other words, with this addition and multiplication, the numbers form a commutative ring. We'll have more to say about the algebraic structure in the next video, so I'll leave it at that for now. Let's put together everything we've seen with an example game. Say we have the sum of a nim pile and a game of turning corners. How can we win? First, we'll need to find the Sprague Grundy values. For the nim pile, that's just five, it's the number of counters. For turning corners, we'll look at the positions of the red coins. That'll give us 2 times 0, plus 1 times 1, and so on. And looking those values up in our multiplication table, we get 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 0 plus 1, which is 2. To win, we need to balance the two games. And 5 is larger than 2, so the definition of the Sprague-Grundy function tells us there's a move which will make the nim pile have value 2, in this case, removing three of the counters. And then our opponent might flip over the four corners. And that'll make the turning corners game have value 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2, which is 3. And now 3 is larger than 2, so there's a move in turning corners, which will bring that value back down to 2. In this case, flipping over these four coins. And then, if the opponent removes the last two counters, 
bringing this down to zero, we can flip over these four coins, bringing this down to zero, and leaving no legal moves, which means we win. We've made a good first foray into the world of Nimbers, but as the title suggests, there's a whole lot more left to explore. Can we divide Nimbers? Do algebra with them? What happens if we don't limit ourselves to finite games? Join me next time as we find out. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.